So um, I'll just chatter for a little bit at you. So while we wait um, for some people to join, and then and then we can go ahead and and start. Um, I am just thrilled about this. Um, you know the book. Uh, hey, Kathleen. Um, the book came out on March 11th, um, Dear Vulcan, with LSU Press, and it, I mean, it really is like a dream come true um, to be with this press and have these, um, these poems that I've worked on for so long um, come together in this beautiful package. And, um, but, you know, it's been, it's been hard to not get to come and visit all of you guys and, and share it with you personally in person and um, you know I know we had a lot of plans in place for that so hopefully you know someday we can we can do an in-person reading but this is exciting and um, I was thinking I don't think I've ever actually done a reading like during the day and without drinking wine first so <laughs> let's see how it goes you know I'll probably be less tongue-tied um, so yeah, um, so uh, I'm, uh, again, Laura Davenport. This is my book, Dear Vulcan. Um, I'm originally from Birmingham, Alabama, and I've also lived in Charleston, um, Richmond, and um, now I live here in Savannah, Georgia. So, um, so very much, you know, living in the South, and uh, I find that my work is really informed by the, the Southern landscape, and um, even I think some of the southern inflection, southern tones. So, um, but you know, if you do see some coastal marshes and things, and you think, well, Birmingham is not uh, coastal, but I'm coastal now. So, um, so that's where that comes in. Um, and <laughs> yeah, Kathleen, I guess yeah, we could we could have some wine. If, if you are welcome, anybody who wants to go ahead, um, go ahead and partake. It'll make it more interesting. Um, but so, uh, yeah, so Birmingham, where I'm from, um, the Magic City, and we got some Birmingham folks on here right now. Um, uh, we have the, the statue of Vulcan is what we're known for. It's the largest cast iron statue in the world. Um, and it's a uh, high atop Red Mountain overlooking the city, and he has this torch that he holds. Um, so you can you can Google an image and and see what he looks like. But um, you know we're the steel city, and it's it's kind of our emblem. And um, we have a joke in Birmingham that wherever you are in Birmingham, you can tell where you are because you can look up and you can see Vulcan. And um, you know you, you see his like big iron butt like pointed at you. So um, so that was something that um, I was thinking about a lot. And then the more I thought about it. Um, he sort of took on some some more symbolism for me, you know. He's he's a god, but he's uh, remote, you know. He's up there. He's kind of like a outdated god, you know. Like nobody worships Vulcan anymore. Um, he's sort of a, a father figure in a way, and he's distant and he he's frozen. And um, so you can really go um, all kinds of interesting places with that and. Um, so that's why I named my book Tear Vulcan, and um, I love the cover design because it's got the rustic, you know, this, this to me like really feels like um, like what I was going for with the book. But um, so I'll start with the title poem, um, and then we'll just kind of see where we where we go from there. And um, I'm going to read a few poems in uh, about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. Or just general praise if you just want to throw some, you know, just lovely comments out there. Um, you've got your feature for your putting in hearts and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but no, I really do appreciate everyone taking time out of their day. And um, it's just nice to be together in this way. And I certainly need some socializing and interaction with um, adults. <laughs> so. Yeah, so um, so it's great to see everybody, and hopefully I'll see you and, and give you a big hug, you know, soon. Um, so we'll start with Dear Vulcan. Deity of retraced steps, observe these hands. 
Again, they gripped the wheel, car parked beside a rain wet mailbox, dark house of another old flame whose father planned a quick sale, cheap move north. The house stays vacant, third yard on this block gone to seed. Above the grass, hanging limp in the half light, a realtor sign sways. A woman's face stares out through plastic. You guys, is it back? Sorry. All right. My mother's house was an uphill walk from here, and the same woman sold it. I had drawn an X across her photograph for a look she gave my father, unhooked her hanging sign, and threw it away. This was before I tried to name the texture of the light outside these windows, the pattern maple leaves made on the driveway. And still I drive in circles, looking for a quiet spot. The question is, what keeps me coming back? This cul-de-sac of black windowed houses, this God who, again and again, shows me only his shoulder. Um, and so, um, just so you know, like in, in my poems, I like to kind of play around with the line and the punctuation to try to the, uh, if a line can possibly have multiple meanings. And, and so if I read it differently than the way you read it, like um, it's probably purposeful. Um, but so, you know, one of these, for example, is the, uh, the question is what keeps me coming back? And I, I changed the punctuation on that line. I had it like the question is what keeps me coming back? And, you know, the question is, and I just, you know, I, I think that's really fun. So if, if you spot any of those in the book, um, that, you know, I kind of want there to be kind of multiple ways that you could, you could read it. Um, so the next poem is a, a Southern landscape poem. And, um, you know, when I was in school and studying writing, um, we were told that you, you can't use cliches, you can't write all this Southern stuff, you know, and, um, and then we had a, a famous poet come to campus and this person was not originally from the South, um, but had moved to the South. And this person, I'm not, not even gonna say he or she, um, was like, oh, the kudzu, and oh, the roadside barbecue shacks, and this and that. And um, I thought, well, that's not fair. Like, why, why does this person get to do it? And we Southerners sometimes, you know, um, maybe, I changed rooms. I hope that will help. I have no idea. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Um, we even have viewers from Switzerland right now. Katie Mackey. Um, we had viewers from Ireland. So we're going global. Oh, love you guys. Okay. So good, people are people found us. So you know, a little bit of drama, a little location switch. Um, like I said, the book came out on March 11th, and the Savannah St. Patrick's Day parade was supposed to be on the 17th, and it was canceled. And um, so we had a, a reading at the uh, the local bookstore, the Book Lady, which is an amazing bookstore if you're ever in Savannah, um, and you know, it was like, is this, is it open? Is it closed? Like, are we, you know, so there's just been so much uncertainty and um, you guys are just, just rocking it. And, um, and I know from talking to a lot of you guys individually that we are all just um, making it work with what we, with what we have. Um, so um, props to everybody who's who's working at home and and um, and trying to do this thing. So okay, shall we read some more? Um, so as I was saying about kudzu, um, you only get one was the advice I was given. If you write too many about kudzu, you're overdoing it. So this I don't think that other one counts. So this is my other kudzu poem. And it's called Lessons from a Normal Childhood. 
I may have dreamed the preschool on a hill above the hospital, how the staff who did not at the time seem bored, but seemed to cherish us, released us to the yard to watch the medevac touchdown. A treat, the shocking noise, because we knew no injury, and it was too far distant to make out small figures on the gurneys. And because my mother worked there at the hospital, I told myself she must be among the white coats rushing to meet the blades and cheered her because I believed she could hear me and knew somehow she needed it. Years later, over dinner, with her back to the television, she told me pointed stories about teenage mothers, how small their babies were. The fathers had no teeth left. Although the chance I'd end up doing meth was slim, or that I'd learn where to find it, since you can only ever tell after the fact, after the shit goes up in flames, after the whole mess blows, then you can see beside some country road the charred halves of a mobile home, the burn so new the kudzu has not yet begun to cover it. All right, so um, we're going to leave the South now for a minute, the American South, and we will travel to post-war Italy. Um, at a at the time I was writing some of these, I was reading the um, Italian poet Cesare Pavese, and um, he uh, he was a um, reviewer, writer. You know, back in the in the day when you had to do everything, he was a poet and a fiction writer and a reviewer and um, a critic and all these things. So um, uh, this poem is. Um, takes a few lines from him, and then I have some poems that are kind of in response to him. So this is called, Some Women Fling Open Their Shutters. It's raining on houses. The blind drops roll down red-tiled roofs, scattering people and things. Hunched under awnings, the children in their school clothes, the cafe breaking up, saucers and papers held high, cups catching rain. Some women fling open their shutters, full wash from the line. High over the street, the pulleys creak and move. It must be redone, shaken out, rinsed again and dried, the sky already on its way to dusk. Now children slither in, soaked, fling rolled knee socks on the radiator. The room is damp and warm, strung up laundry tickles their necks, a fan whirs. Didn't these women see what would happen? Gathering clothes from corners, under beds, the morning clouds piled on the sky's edge. Dark imprints from the first drops dampened undershirts, quill work pants weighed the line. Day's labor is gone. No time now to laze under a lamp, warm in the rising breeze. No time to read husband's paper and with care recrease press it smooth into its place beside his chair. Um, so that poem is kind of about the, um, the uh, all the, the unseen labor that um, historically women do to keep the household running. And I know now that we're all uh, at home, gosh, it feels like, <laughs> it feels like there's more of it somehow. Um, and, um, you know, while I was reading Pavese and I was loving the uh, the landscapes and just the beautiful moments that he had, um, there was just there just seemed to be no place for women in his world, um, and so that kind of led me to this idea of the city without women. and And in the book, um, there's the poems are are short and they're kind of spaced out throughout the book, but I'm just going to read three of them all together for you. Um, and another kind of challenge that I set for myself in writing this was to try to tell a story with as few words um, as possible. So, in the city without women. This field is no good, which is why the horse has wandered. Two men slap dust from their boots. All day the boy leans against the fence, watching the men and the tiny purple flowers. He knows it isn't hard to catch a horse. At dusk, he lies flat in the field until his body is
I can feel warm breath in his ear, a wet mouth searching the flowers. You guys, stop using all my internet. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next one is, is that how internet works? How does the internet work? Because I really don't know. Um, in the city without women. The boy says, someday I will see the ocean and it will move me. He sits in the lane in the expanding dusk, his back against the wall of a house. The boy has learned words from a sailor's book, white cap, trough. When you walk in the salty water, the cuts on your ankles will sting. The boy wants only to sit on a wall with his feet in the sand, to watch men cast line into the waves and smell the wind. Really, the boy is afraid. He has heard about the tides, the way at night the sea draws forward as if of its own accord. All right. The boy draws sails with a chip of stone. This is the ship he'll build one day. The street is empty after rain. No sign of the old dog the boy would like to catch. He'd brush its fur and bathe it in the river. Think hard enough about a thing and it happens. The dog passed through this alley once, right where the boy is standing. The boy stretched out his arm and raked thick fur with his fingers. The smell stayed with him the whole day after, like crushed grass beside the river, like waking in wet clover. And we'll do one more. Um, I want to be patient with your time here, guys. And then um, I would love to answer questions or um, talk to you guys a little bit more. So um, this last poem um, is called Quitting. Every cigarette I smoked was sorrowful, and so I gave them up. I didn't inhale, had to lean against a porch rail with one floodlight behind me, and the yard below had to be dark. In the car, I was afraid the ash would set aflame the back seat, the fire would spread to the gas tank and the open bottles of Zima. And the shame of drinking Zima stays with me whenever I hear that song we played, which meant everything, as if our lives could be summed up just like that, beautiful and full of longing. Could be charted, verse and chorus, like the staggered tarot lines we read the future in, a few short weeks in summer. Thank you. Yeah, I liked reading them all together. That was kind of interesting, because usually I read them, um, you know, in the book, they're, they're spread out. So it kind of creates a different effect. Does anybody else have a question? Okay, cool, Katie. Um, well, the the Italy poem was um, because I was reading this Italian poet, uh, Cesare Pavese, and um, sometimes you know, at least for me, when I'm when I'm really reading and studying somebody, they kind of like get into my head, and I think a lot of writers talk about that. Like when they're writing, they try to avoid um, other outside influences for that reason. But I did see a lot of parallels in, as weird as it sounds, like his kind of rural upbringing and the way that landscape was so important in his poems and then the way that I feel like landscape is really important to me too. So um, we kind of cross, cross the boundaries there. Um, Jenny says, how's quarantine affecting you as a poet? Um, uh, Jenny, you know, actually, um, so I'm,
age four and one are my kids. And so um, it's really more about the time. I feel like I have a lot of ideas, um, but it's just kind of like getting through the day to day is, is hard right now. Um, and then I'm, I'm questioning, you know, about like, I know a lot of people are writing like pandemic stuff. And I, I did write like one or two, but I've, I don't know, I sort of think that if for it to be lasting, it's going to have to, you know, you're going to have to tie to something else. Like, what are we going to think five years from now? you know, when we read it. So, you know, um, I don't know. I kind of have to have to write about not just like the thing that happened, but like, okay, what is like the bigger picture of those? So does that, I don't know, does that make sense? But mostly it's just, um, I mean, I'm sitting here in my house all day surrounded by all these books that I don't have time to read. And <laughs> it's pretty frustrating. Um, thank you, Azra. Yeah, I hope that you um, recognize some things from some of those poems since uh, from from our high school days. Um, how do you choose poems for a specific collection? Um, in general, like when you get uh, about 50 to 60 pages together, you have enough for a collection. It doesn't necessarily mean that you want to include all of them, but um, what I did was read through them, lay them out on the floor, um, and, and try to think about are there, are there threads, are there common things that these poems are trying to accomplish, and I think the real magic of creating a collection is that, like, you don't realize that your work has all these common themes necessarily until you actually, like, start putting the poems together, and you're like, whoa, like, this one that I wrote five years ago feels has a similarity to this one and um and then together they kind of become stronger um in this way and bounce off each other so some of the poems in the collection that I didn't I mean I like all of them but some that I didn't think were like as strong but then in in relation to other ones in the book they're like they're given more a little bit more power because they're about common um common topics so for me, um, I felt like there was a real common thread of this, uh, you know, male, female, um, coming of age, trying to understand. And, and for me, that 